Welcome back, fight fans, to the Career Profiles podcast. With me, your host, Sean, joined, as always, by Johnston for another episode about the life, times of a certain fighter within this great sport that we love so dearly. And this episode is all about Duke McKenzie, MBE. One of the greatest British fighters of all time. Vastly underrated by many boxing fans. And this generation of boxing fans certainly don't appreciate what Duke achieved throughout his boxing career. And certainly what he's also doing outside of the ring as well. And this is a perfect episode to bring him back to the forefront of the boxing fan's mind. So I'm delighted to be doing this and obviously I've spoken to Duke quite recently ahead of doing this episode and he's done an interview separately about his charity work which you can check on the main BTR boxing podcast feed but I'm delighted to be doing this one because Duke is such a nice guy. I've had many interactions with him over the years and I've seen his punditry. I've always appreciated what he's brought to, to the commentary and the punditry of boxing and of course what he's done inside the squared circle. So I'm glad to be doing this one, Johnston. It's a, it's a really great episode and a really feel-good story. It is a real feel-good story and, and it is a lot that happens with Duke and it's almost hard to believe at times some of the stuff that has happened to him in his life outside the ring and then what he went on to achieve inside of it. So it's it's a it's a fantastic career profile for us to do. And as you say, you've, you've had the pleasure of being able to talk to, to the man and and from everything I've read and, and heard from Duke McKenzie, he sounds like a real down-to-earth kind of guy. Obviously, from my neck of the woods, South East London as well. So, But as you rightly said, he's very underrated. People forget about this guy. And it's great to be able to do career profiles like this because it brings him to light. Hopefully, those that listen will end up going back and watching some of his fights because he truly is one of the best British boxers that's ever lived. So we'll take this right back to the beginning, as always. And we'll go from the day he was born on May the 5th, 1963. And he lived with his five brothers, Ray, Michael, Winston, Clinton, Dudley, and one sister, Beverly, at 103 Birchanger Road in South Norwood, South East London. And he recalled himself, Duke, that it was probably some of the happiest times of his life. His dad, Dudley Senior, worked two jobs in the Croydon area to provide for the family in the Lombard North Central Bank post room during the day, and at night he would work as a baker. While Dudley Senior worked long hours, seven days a week, Duke's mum was training to be a nurse. But as with many households across the country during this time, Dudley Senior ruled his house with fear. And Duke remembers my upbringing was probably no different to any other West Indian family of that generation. My dad ruled us with fear, and he continued to say, Back chat my dad, tell my dad to shut up, or no I'm not doing it, or no I'm not going out, or there's just no way. My dad would take your head off. He was quite a violent man, and there's no getting away from that. Interestingly, Duke did not see his violence as all bad, and he believes that he learned something from it, and he said, He taught us so many lessons over the years. So many life skills in a lot of ways. He taught us how to be men. Just to get an idea of the punishment his father would dish out when feeling the need to discipline his kids, Duke told this story and he said, He would get us into the front room, take all the furniture out, take the television out, take the settees out, and he would leave you in there for about an hour. He would go outside, get a big piece of stick, come back and just let you have it. For about a good 20 minutes to half an hour. He would say to him, what was that all about? And he would say, I'm not going to ruin my furniture. I'm not going to break anything that I spent my hard-earned cash on. Well, well, today would be obviously considered to be abusive behaviour, but during this time, it was a normal occurrence. And many kids up and down the country were disciplined physically. It doesn't make it right, but you just can't hide away from that fact. And some kids would break and others would come through it. Life was tough in those days. I'm sure many of our parents would have told us similar stories and, and the kids were not the only ones who felt the wrath of their father. Uh, their mother got it worse. Duke recalled that my dad just knocked the stuffing out of her. She would get it on a regular basis. But I don't think my upbringing was any different from anybody else's of that generation. There were a lot of families that went through what we went through and 
just basically just highlighting the fact what I just said there. And Duke had a very modest opinion of how hard life was for him at a very young age. But that strength came from within by watching and learning from his two dearest brothers in Clinton and especially Dudley. And they showed Duke the love and attention that his dad never gave him and they couldn't completely fill that void, but they did more than enough to direct Duke onto the right path. Clinton was his oldest brother and he kick-started the family's love affair with boxing through a friend at St. Christopher's in Croydon called Frankie Lucas. Now, he was a quality amateur, excellent professional, fighting 17 times and actually challenged for the British title, losing to Tony Simpson and Kevin Finnegan. Now, through Lucas, Clinton began to box, which inspired Winston, Dudley, and then Duke to follow in his footsteps. And as Duke remembers, it was like a domino effect. Surprisingly, it wasn't Clinton, Winston, or Duke that caught the attention from those within the area. It was actually Dudley who was the more natural in the boxing ring. Dudley was just a natural in the ring. He was good at all sports, naturally gifted after the across all the sports. And Duke recalls, at 14 and 15, Dudley had an eight-pack. Dudley had muscles. He was really just an elite athlete. Dudley was good at everything. He was good at that 4x4 four four relay, the 100 metres and the 200 metres. On track day, Dudley would clean up. Apart from his brother, Duke's first inspiration in boxing was none other than the great Muhammad Ali. That was closely followed by Roberto Duran, and Duke recalled, he was the next big thing in world boxing at that time, and I had never seen anything like him. He was just different. He was like nothing I had certainly seen before. But his main inspiration was his brothers, Clinton being his favourite growing up. And he was more than a brother. He was like a father figure to Duke. And he said that he would give him pocket money and take me to the shops, feed me, clothe me, love me, bathe me, whatever I needed he provided. Clinton was also the first Mackenzie to progress at a higher level before Dudley and Duke. He was the oldest, born in Clarendon, Jamaica, and was nine years old when the family emigrated to England. He won the 1976 ABA British Light Welterweight title and went boxing out of the Sir Philip Game ABC and represented Great Britain at the 1976 Olympics in Montreal, Canada. Clinton won his first two fights before losing to the eventual gold medal winner, a certain Sugar Ray Leonard. So that's, that's quality, that, isn't it? I mean, it just shows you that's just a high level right there. And inspired by his brother, father figure Clinton, at the age of 13, Duke laced up the gloves for the first time to actually compete in an amateur fight, I suppose, or to actually spar at 13. It didn't end quite the same way. I mean, his, his amateur career was nothing like his brother's. In actual fact, he was quite the opposite. And he actually self-confessed himself he was a bad amateur, a bad amateur boxer. Had you confessed that all five elder brothers, who were, they were all stronger, and a sister who never boxed but was actually a black belt in judo. And he, he said it was a, a bit embarrassing because she used to throw me all over the place. <laughs> he was right down the pecking order very early in his in his life. And all, although boxing was difficult for him as an amateur, he refused to give up and won his very first contest, in actual fact. And he recollected that back then uh, they were called gym shows. I think I was about 14, maybe a bit younger. I was petrified. When you were young and your brothers have been so successful, you want to be like them. And that can put a lot of pressure on you and it did to me and Dudley Senior well when he found out that Duke had now followed in his brother's footsteps he told him under no uncertain terms to stop attending the gym and to give up boxing altogether but Duke did not allow his father to cast his iron fist this time and he actually decided to persevere and he said my dad never boxed at all as a child he actually discouraged me to go to the gym so I had to sneak out he would actually wait for his dad to leave for his night shift and then follow his brothers to the gym. Everything seemed to be going according to plan for a while until one night his dad came home early. And this is what he remembers. I got home, had something to eat, jumped in the shower and then jumped into bed, not realising my dad was under the sheet. 
He rolled over. And I died at that point. It was all over. The game was up. The inevitable beating came. And Duke remembered. I took a beating that night and swore I would never do it again. That was the Tuesday. Then on the Thursday, when he went to work again, I got up and I went back to the gym. And he did the same thing again and caught me again. But Duke had now gone past the point of no return and no longer cared about what his dad would do to him if he was caught again. So he continued to box and aspired to be like his brothers. With his brothers doing their thing and beginning to turn against their dad, it was their mum that suffered the continued physical abuse at the hands of her husband. There was no way out for her until she decided enough was enough and filed for divorce. It was at this point Dudley Senior would have felt that he was losing control over the family unit, so to try and maintain his grip over the kids, he got them all in the front room and gave them an ultimatum, which Duke recalls. He sat us down and said, I'm divorcing your mum. She's going. If any of you want to go with her, then get up now and go. We all looked at each other and literally crapped ourselves because we knew that if any of us got up and said anything, he would let us have it. Dudley was the only one that got up and said, I'm going with mum. And of course, his dad, Dudley Senior, dished out another beating to maintain his power over the family. Duke said, From that day, my dad was just looking for an excuse to give him a good hiding. And he got a good hiding on a regular basis. So not long after the intimidation tactic from Dudley Senior, he decided while going through the messy divorce, to give his wife another beating. That was when the boys decided that they had seen enough and Clinton, Winston, Dudley, Ray and Michael, they all jumped on their dad and managed to stop him from carrying out further punishment on their poor mum. And, and Duke said he showed remorse for the first time, but it didn't stop him. There was always going to be another reason or another excuse to get on my mum. Now, when he did actually mention the, the brothers jumped on, no one actually got hurt, but he just prevented obviously they're rather from getting any more beatings and a decision had to be made about where the boys would live and Duke was always going to stick with his brothers Clinton and Dudley so they decided to live with their dad uh, for a while at least and with all the dramas at home the boys continued to box Clinton and Dudley were progressing nicely while Duke despite winning his first amateur fight was in a bad one of form and he actually recalled this he said I had 65 amateur fights one about 30. At one point, I think I lost 17 fights back to back. I have the worst career pedigree of any professional world champion. Yeah, it wasn't great at all. He worked under the tutelage of the respected Chapman brothers. Duke and Dudley were trained by Tony and Clinton was under Ray. There was no real reason as to why Duke just could not cut it in the amateurs. Uh, maybe his brother's success held him back or maybe he just wasn't able to adapt to that style. He, of course, would have doubts about his future in the sport and he often pondered giving it up. But it was always his brother, Dudley, who would always encourage him. And it was around this time that Dudley realised that living with their dad was not such a good idea after all. And he told Duke, we have to get out of here because if we stay, something bad was going to happen. He made the joint decision to leave home for good. And Duke said, me and Dudley left home when I was 15. We had to get away. We planned it one day in 1979. Dudley was off to the World Junior Championships representing Great Britain in Yokohama, Japan. But before he left, we plotted our escape. We packed a load of stuff into a bag. And when Dad went to work one day, we disappeared and never went back. Once out of the house, they concentrated on their boxing. Although Duke's amateur career was still bang average, it wasn't a complete disaster. Duke recalled that the only thing I won was the London NABAs, the National Amateur Boxing Championships. If you won that, you won a scholarship to go to Holland for two weeks. That was a brilliant experience. I went over with top boxers like Errol Christie, Chris Pyatt, Tony Adams, and we all got on really well. That's when things took a different turn for me. Mr. Philip Game ABC Jim in Croydon closed, so his trainer, Tony Chapman, introduced him and Dudley to Colin Smith, who was at Battersea Amateur Club. And from day one, they hit it off. 
Smith became not only a close friend and a coach, but also a father figure, something that Duke admitted that he craved. Dudley had it with Tony, Clinton had it with Ray, and now Duke finally got that person who could put an arm around him, spend time listening and advising him. During his time at the Battersea gym, Duke bumped into a certain promoter, Mickey Duff, and he was encouraged by his brother to approach the legendary manager and matchmaker. Duke said, Dudley said to me, there's Mickey Duff, go and talk to him, ask him to manage you, which I did, and he just said, I'm always in America, I'm never in England, I haven't got time for this, I haven't got time for you, you're a black flyweight, you won't turn any tickets, you're an average amateur, and you haven't won anything, Mickey Duff being pretty harsh on him, quite, quite, quite harsh on him there, isn't he? <laughs> He's, by the sounds of things, he was very down the line, wasn't he, Mickey? And, and Duke said that, you know, it's the one thing he appreciated with him. There was no bullshit with Mickey Duff. Now, Duke, obviously, he must have felt those words were a bit harsh, but he wasn't dejected. And Dudley kept his confidence up. And when he told him to not take no for an answer, he even said, we'll get his phone number, ring up his office, and we'll arrange an appointment and we'll go and see him. And that is precisely what they did the very next day, in fact. But Mickey never showed up. Rather than take the hint, Duke, who was now 19, he was unemployed, and he decided to continue his trips to the West End to Mickey Duff's office, which was on Walbur Street. And he made that a frequent occurrence. So and he's, he's in between, he hasn't got a job. He's 19, and he said he actually quite enjoyed traveling up to the West End. He liked getting himself ready. And he would arrive at the office in the morning and sit there until 5 p.m. in hope that Mickey Duff would meet him again. And then, funny enough, Duke become that much of a regular that he got to know Mickey's secretary and he even named them Eileen, Jill and Valerie. <laughs> it's brilliant. Eileen, he said, would make him a cup of tea and, and make apologies for Mickey's no-show, but Duke would be back the very next day to do it all over again. He said it was a great experience as well, just, just being around the surroundings of this office and seeing, like, people come in and out. But then one day, Eileen made an appointment with Mickey and Mickey showed up. And this is what Duke recalled. He said, he shook my hand. We had a bit of a chat and he said again, but very politely this time, Duke, with the best will in the world, lad, I can't manage you. I'll get a caretaker manager and I'll oversee. Duke said, it's not good enough. I'm not having it. Mickey's response was, well, that's as good as it gets. And that was that. So still refusing to take no for an answer, Duke continued to show up in his office and basically forced his way in as a member of staff without actually getting any money for it. He made friends with everyone, became an errand boy and a team maker. And that was when Mickey Duff finally gave Duke a job. And that certainly shows that persistence pays off. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Mickey Duff, he was managing the Black Flyweight Champion Kelvin Smart at the time and he arranged for Duke to spar with him and this is Duke's account of what happened next he said I started sparring Kelvin Smart I literally shut my eyes because he came flying at me I threw a shot and I think I shattered his cheekbone his nose or something the fight he was due to have as in Kelvin Smart was postponed there was a phone call back to Mickey Duff's office and within a space of about two hours Mickey had called me and said come to my office I did. He said to me, there's a contract in my office, sign it. Of course, Duke and his persistence paid off big time. He signed the contract and he made his professional debut at the age of 19 on November the 23rd, 1982, stopping Charlie Brown in just one round at Wembley Arena on the same card as future opponent Charlie Magre. A young Frank Bruno and Clinton McKenzie, who was 25 and 9 by this point, was also on that card. The second fight came two months later against Andy King at the Anglo-American Sporting Club in Mayfair, London. It took Duke two rounds to stop him. In between those bouts, Dudley lost for the first time as a professional. And after losing again in the April of 1983, he decided his pro career wasn't working out. And he called it a day. This was to the benefit of Duke because... He chose to put all his time and energy into his younger brother's career. Duke revealed just how valuable his brother's addiction to the team was and he said, I relied on him so much. If Dudley told me I could beat Mike Tyson, I'd have believed him. 
totally made me believe in myself. Right, it just shows you, Ali didn't have the best of professional careers, but yet he's a, it was a great inspiration for a Duke and well, everything seemed to be falling into place for him. And he had Colin Smith as his trainer, he had Mickey Duff now as his manager. And his oldest brother was there to help with decisions and obviously the motivation side of things. And if things could not be any better, he recalled on another day that was a life-changing moment from a day that he received an unexpected call. And he said, I was working as a labourer. I'm guessing he was sort of in between. I'm not quite sure if it was just before these pro fights or if it was in between. The way it worked out, sort of doing our research, it seemed like he was starting off his career today, his labor job. So this is, this is his, what, what he recalled. He said, I was working as a laborer. I was shoveling shit and it was pouring with rain. And someone said, Duke, there's a phone call for you. I said, who is it? And he said, it's Mickey Duff. I ran to the phone and I said, what do you want, Mick? I'm busy. The things just quickly turn around. <laughs> I'm busy, Mick. He said, there's a ticket at Heathrow airport for you. I've got you a flight to Las Vegas. See you over there. Now, while we're in America, obviously, obviously Duke, he obviously told his boss, told his boss, I'm leaving. And he went to America. Now, while in America, Duke had the pleasure of sharing a room with the future WBC World Super Welterweight Champion, John the Beast Mugabe. People may recall him with his fight with, with Hagler. And Duke said, Mugabe was a funny guy, always smoking and joking. He was rubbish at running, but he'd work hard in the gym. And he also made another close friend that still exists today. He keeps contact with this guy. And that's Cornelius Bowser Edwards. And uh, Duke recalled that John was really good friends with Cornelius. And it was always me, John and Bozza and a few others in training. We were always down at Johnny Tocco's gym in downtown Vegas, which was like a hub for boxing. That was a real hotbed of raw, pure, world-class talent. And Duke explained his experience just with pure delight. It was in his words, in Johnny Tocco's gym, there was Hector Camacho training. He would come in, do a three or four hour slot and disappear. Then Bozer Edwards would train after that. Bozer would walk out and Edwin Rosario would come in and out. And then Livingston Bramble, Evander Holyfield, you name it. I mean, he's dropping names left, right and centre here. And he, he said, I was like a kid in a sweet shop, sweet shop, watching all these great champions working out, getting a buzz, just being around them. From the minute I started my workout in the morning, I was there until 10 p.m. It, 10 p.m. it was surreal, unbelievable experience. One I'll never forget. And I oh, absolutely believe that because that, that sounds unreal. Massively great experience for him. Being around all these guys, the Camachos, the Rosarios, the Holyfields of the world. I'm pretty sure he would have picked up a lot and soaked it up like a sponge when he was around there that time. Well, the time spent in America was not all about training amongst the world's best. Duke also had four fights, winning all four by stoppage. He fought at the Showboat Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, the Reno Sparks Convention Center in Reno, the Tropicana Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City, and in the one fight he will never forget at the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles, and that fight, was the second of four bouts in America, and it was a three-round stoppage against Gregorio Hernandez. But it wasn't the fight that stuck in the memory of Duke. It was the aftermath. And this is what happened, and Duke said, When I stopped this guy, Mickey Duff went over to the corner to console them and shake hands. Mickey put his hands out, and the guy just punched him right in the mouth, and it all kicked off in the ring. There was this little guy called Norman Lockwood, a really good cuts guy on our team, and he jumped on this guy. It all went really mad, and we had to be ushered out of there by security. The experience clearly helped Duke immensely because he came back from the States and continued his winning form. To end 1983, Duke went the full six-round distance for the first time in his career against the undefeated Alan Limarola, who was 5-0 at the Wembley Arena in a very close fight that he won by half a point. Referee Roy Francis scored the fight 59-58.5 to and a half in Duke McKenzie's favour. After a quick victory over the pond at the Sands Casino Hotel in Atlantic City on the undercard of Tony Sibson, a further two triumphs followed back in London, which set up a shot at the British flyweight title, which was vacant against Danny Flynn, who was 9-2-1. Now, the title had actually been vacated by Hugh Russell because 
He retired after winning the Lonsdale belt outright with come from behind last round stoppage against Charlie Brown. Now Duke was under no illusions as to how difficult an opponent Flynn was going to be. But he wanted that prestigious title more than anything. And he said, that was my first real test to gauge myself in terms of levels. Once again, his inspiration was his brother Clinton, who had won the Lonsdale belt at super lightweight against Jim Montague in 1978. And Duke said, I wanted one really badly. I still think to this day that it's the best belt in the world by none. There's nothing like it, in my opinion. And I sort of make it right there. It was a lovely belt. And it was Duke's first scheduled 12 rounder as well. It was at the Royal Albert Hall. It was on June 5th, 1985. And Duke basically was in no mood to let this opportunity slide. And en route to a fourth round stoppage, he actually floored Flynn six times to pick up the British title and also go 11 and 0 with eight by way of knockout, which is an impressive start considering what his amateur career was like. Now, two fights and 11 months later, on May the 20th, 1986, the younger, fresher Duke, who had prepared in America with high-class sparring again, including shadow boxing with the late, great Edwin Rosario, took on the European flyweight champion, Champagne, Charlie Magri. That was the same guy he fought on, on the same card as on his debut. Now, the British title was also on the line that he'd picked up, and that he... Was Magri was actually the betting favourite, but it, Mag, he was also the WBC, the former WBC flyweight champion. Now, because of the experience of Magri, he was that obviously the betting favourite against McKenzie and the unknown commodity of the division. So Duke actually recollected that Charlie was the darling of British boxing back then. I'd been written off by the press for being too young, naive, and not really ready. Again, I drew on my experience on America. I had sparred this guy called Juan Muriel from Puerto Rico, and he actually mimicked Charlie's style really well. So going into that fight, I was on point. His experience in America was only his confidence booster. His now head trainer Colin Smith said that Magri was tailor-made for Duke. Clinton was adamant that youth would prevail, and Dudley was just confident in his brother's ability. Duke did produce the goods on the night and forced Magri to retire in the fifth and he praised his manager Mickey Duff for picking the right time for him to face Magri who at this point was on the way down while he, as in Duke, was on the way up and Duke said Mickey Duff was a genius. The card also featured some top class talent in Lloyd Hunnigan, Chris Pyatt, Michael Watson, James Cook and Gary Mason. A month before Duke was due to make his first defence of the EBU European flyweight title in Italy, he flew out to Atlantic City for a tune-up against Lee Cargill and took a 10-round decision. It was the perfect preparations for a visit to Italy against Giampiero Pina, who was 14-3. and three. And in a difficult environment and a hostile atmosphere, Duke came through a very messy fight where he put Pina down to win a majority decision. Duke fought just twice in 1987, appointing Jose Manuel Diaz and Juan Herrera, before making his second defence of the European flyweight title against Agapito Gomez of Spain. This fight was actually broadcast live on the BBC, topping the bill of a Mike Barrett and Mickey Duff co-promotion, which also featured two of Britain's best prospects in the heavyweight Gary Mason and middleweight Michael Watson. The fight lasted just two rounds, Duke scored his first knockout in 22 months and further stamped his authority in the world rankings. Absolutely. Uh, European champion now and since becoming the European champion in May 1986, Mickey Duff was desperate to get his young star a shot at a world title when his target was the WBC flyweight champion, Sot Chitalada. Their pursuit had lasted about 18 months, but for several reasons, that fight just didn't materialise. And Duke recalled, if I had fought Chitalada, I would have had to fight in Thailand, where he's from, or somewhere in Asia. So they refocused their attention on the IBF champion, Rolando Boho, who was from the Philippines, obviously thinking he's going to go to the Philippines, but Duke was almost resigned to that fact as well, that he's going to be fired overseas his first world title shot but opportunity presented itself and that was 
in the form of his manager. Mickey said he could get him a world title fight in the UK. He said, my reaction was one of total disbelief. And on October the 5th, 1988, Duke finally got his shot at world title against Boho, who was 24 2 and 2. And Mackenzie at the time now was 20 and 0 with 10 knockouts. Now, interestingly, it was never something Duke thought about when turning professional. And this is what he explained. He said, It was never a boyhood dream of mine to become a world champion. My dream was to follow my older brother Clinton and become a British champion. And when I did that, I was more than satisfied. But when you win the British, you get an automatic European rating. And when you win the European title, you get an automatic world rating. And then it goes from there. Well, that moment had come and Duke's pre-fight nerves were uncontrollable. Now, the Boho fight, this is in uh, Duke's words, the Boho fight was at the Grand Hall in Wembley, London. And it's about, I'm never going to forget. I had plenty of doubt going into the fight, but Dudley was confident for me. He was my big brother, mentor, and life coach. And on the morning of the fight, I'd been crying through fear and nothing helps. And he was literally, he, he was so worried that he just weren't going to happen for him. It took a Dudley pep talk to settle Duke down. And this is what Duke said. He said, Dudley got to my house about six that morning because he was so excited for me. He knocked on the door. And when I opened it, he said, little man, which is what he used to call me. What's the matter? I said, the fear of defeat. But more so, the fear of getting knocked out is starting to get a hold of me. He took both my hands, put them on his face and he said, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. You can't taste, you can't smell, you can't see it. The only way you can control it is by talking yourself into the fight. You've got to take the fight one round at a time. And that is what Duke did. His pre-fight nerves slowly disappeared throughout the fight as he produced a masterclass. And this is what Boxing News reported on that fight. They wrote, Oh Hall, a southpaw, never competed as an amateur before turning professional in 1984 and could not get inside Master Jabber McKenzie. The Englishman patiently bossed matters from the start, not once getting flustered and exhibiting to all how to contain a lively opponent. He applied the finishing touches when he dropped Bohol twice in the 11th at exactly the right time. Mackenzie's emotional post-fight interview said it all about what the victory meant to him. Now, Duke Mackenzie had stylishly outboxed Bohol from start to finish and afterwards he was so overwhelmed with emotion that he could hardly speak during an interview with the BBC's Harry Carpenter. Duke remembered him and Dudley cuddling and crying for ages in the ring and the raw emotion from his brother and he said, all I could hear was my brother crying. He wasn't shouting, he was literally just howling and he kept saying, we did it, we finally did it. It really was a great achievement from, from Duke, considering where he come from, from an amateur, obviously then going down the British to the European and the world, and he produced a performance like that, considering how fearful he was as well. Uh, a fantastic performance from him that night. And you can go and have a look at this on YouTube, go check it out and just see how much of a one-sided destruction it is really from Duke. A fantastic performance, clinical. So being a world champion, well, it wasn't all it cracked up to be for Duke. He actually struggled with his overnight fame. Now, it was, he said in his own words, it was a surreal emotion being crowned world champion. I had near enough a breakdown because I had gone from being a nothing and a nobody to being crowned the world champion. I'd been invited to Stringfellow's nightclubs, uh, Buckingham Palace on chat and, and on chat shows and living a celebrity lifestyle. And I wasn't ready for it. He just didn't prepare. Obviously, you know, he, he in his head, he's going to lose the fight. Then he wins it and then he gets all this fame. So it's just too much for him. And Duke actually ended, though, going back to the ring, 1988, with a 10-round non-title fight at the Elephant and Castle, which ain't far from me. Didn't work far from there either against um, Artemino Ruiz before making his first defence of that title against an American Southpaw again, Tony DeLuca, at the Royal Albert Hall, another great venue on March 8th, 1989. Now, it was the days before the fight that Duke witnessed a truly ter terrifying moment, the, the Pearly Station rail crash. Now, Duke remembered the tragedy 10 years on with the Sutton and Croydon Guardian. And this is what he said. He said it was pretty traumatic whose Glen Avenue home actually backed onto the Brighton line. 
he said, uh, this is, this is his own words. This is what happened. So it was three days before the championship fight at the Royal Albert Hall. And it could have cost me my title, but I shall never forget how others lost so much more. He heard an almighty explosion. All hell broke loose and panic set in. I leapt up or leapt out like I was a paramedic or something. But when I saw the devastation, I did not know what to do. If I had more time to think, I probably wouldn't have even rushed in like I did. I remember speaking to a lady who was about 50 or 60 years old and was in a bad way. I was trying to calm her down. It took me years to get back on the train, but eventually I woke up and smelled the coffee. You could get run over it every day and you have to move on. And I just pray it never happens again. So that is a crazy moment. He's literally his house backed off onto the, onto the train line. It's a mad crash and instincts just jumps in and, and he runs out and sort of helps those that are injured. But wow, what a story. Terrible story. A really terrible one. And I'm sure many people from that area of, of, of London will remember it well. Probably left, left a lot of lasting damage for a lot of people. I can't even, can't even begin to imagine. But for Duke, it was just a moment that you know, he will never forget in his, in his life. But when he did fight De Luca only days after the crash, he actually stopped him in the fourth round with the American cut and swollen under his right eye. Duke was ahead on all three of the judges' scorecards at the time of the stoppage. Apart from the train crash, all seemed to be going well for the new champ. That was until June the 7th, 1989, when he fought the Northern Irishman with a deceptive record, Dave McCauley, who was 12-2-2. For the first time, Duke was having difficulties making the weight, and he said, I had horror stories to make weight. I failed on the first attempt on the morning of the fight and I had to go into a boiler room in Leicester Square where the weigh-in was and it took me over an hour to skip the weight off. I was drained. I got off the scales, Mickey Duff said. Fuck me, lad. You look like a black pair of braces. I was so drawn and drained. And with Duke not in prime physical condition, the writing was on the wall. You must give credit to Dave McCauley because he had been out of the ring for 15 months and he produced the performance of his life in an impressive display to snatch the IBF title away from Duke McKenzie by unanimous decision. All three judges scored the contest on 17-113 and 115-113 twice, bringing an end to Duke McKenzie's unbeaten record. Duke explains himself what happened that night at the Wembley Arena and he said, quite clearly underestimated him. Given the fact that he'd been on the deck 17 times prior to fighting me, three weeks before the fight, and this isn't an excuse, it's a fact. I was in Barbados with my brother Dudley as his best man because he was getting married. It was 90 degree heat every day, and although I was running every day, the weight wasn't coming off because I was drinking and eating as I normally would. It's not an excuse, but I think clearly it, the underestimation of him and also the fact that you know he, he's in... Barbados. He comes back, I think two is before the fight as well, and he's overweight and he has to go to some sort of health farm to sort himself out. So, you know, it wasn't plain sailing, but, you know, you've got to give credit where credit's due. And it was a good performance from McCauley. And I, I think even Duke said, he said, from the first round he hit me, I was, I, I knew my, my title had gone because he felt it. That's what happens when, when you're sort of struggling with the weight. And, and Mickey Duff, well, he told not to go as well, uh, telling him in terms of don't go to Barbados. He said, don't take your after prior. But Dudley didn't just ask Duke to be there. You know, he said that he needed him there. So he couldn't say no to him. He was his best friend and, and he loved his brother. So he couldn't let him down. So it was it's a bit of a rock and a hard place. And Duke remembered that when I came back to the McCauley fight, I thought I'd beat him because he couldn't take a shot, being down so many times. But it was me that was there for the taking. And from the very first moment, Duke knew he was in trouble. He hit me with a good shot. And all I kept thinking was, I've got 11 more hands of this. I can't let this guy knock me out. His instincts to survive was what kept him in the fight. But it wasn't enough. And it was this fight that made him realise that he had now outgrown this division. And it was time to move up rather than continue to struggle at making weight. He said the defeat came as a relief, actually, uh, making eight stone had become the bane of my life. So he moved up and Duke won two fights over the bantamweight limit to finish off 1989 and to prepare his body for the 118-pound division, two weight classes above the flyweight. 
Now, he had a bad start in 1990. A couple of fights were arranged that fell through. And then he also got suspected glandular fever and he couldn't train. And Duke remembered going to top Harley Street doctors and they couldn't do anything. Crazily, but he said, I went to a Chinese herbalist, job done. So it worked for him. The delay had kept the former world champion out of the ring for 10 months in all. That was when Duke got a call from Mickey Duff's office again. And he was told that he's got a shot at a vacant EBU European bantamweight title against Thierry Jacob, who was 33 and 3 in Calais, France on September the 30th, 1990. So the former champion, Vincenzo Belcastro of Italy, had actually decided to move down to the super flyweight division in a bid to win the IBF world title. So therefore, that's why this European title became vacant. Duke went into the fight as an underdog, despite the Frenchman's failure to win two world titles and the prestigious EBU belt. However, Jacob was probably considered more natural at the weight had fought at bantamweight or super bantamweight his whole career and he was fighting on home soil. Mickey Duff on the other hand felt like Duke had enough ability and the style to win especially because he was a former champion. Duke was also confident in taking the victory after watching several videotapes of his southpaw opponent. The stance was never a problem for Duke because Dudley and Clinton were both lefties. A perfect preparation and he had won a world title against the southpaw in Boho. What Duke and his team didn't legislate with the mind games and tactics that would be deployed. Naively, Mickey Dorff had allowed the French to arrange the transport of the ferry, the hotel and the places to dine. Duke and Colin Smith arranged to meet Mickey Dorff and Denny Mancini in Calais the day before the official weigh-in. Mancini was the cutsman for Duke McKenzie that night but for those that didn't know, he was actually a true legend of the game as a manager, a promoter, a trainer, an agent, and patching up fighters in between rounds. He was a man of many, many tricks. But back to this story. Duke and Colin were greeted off the ferry by Jacob's people, and, and this is what Duke remembers about this moment. He said, they drove us around for about four hours. It was like being on a Formula One race with Lewis Hamilton. We were driving over 100 miles an hour in across lanes, nearly hitting cars and bouncing off cars. Duke, by this point, must have thought he got in the wrong car, especially with a language barrier as well. But the ordeal didn't quite end there. <laughs> Duke continued his story. He said, when we came off the motorway um, and was driving through the town, this guy was driving on the wrong side of the road and nearly crashed into another car. He got out of the car and started a big argument with the guy in the other car. And they nearly got into a punch-up. There was a little bit of a scuffle going on, which took another hour to get sorted. We wanted to go to the gym to check our weight, but the gym was locked. So Duke and Colin finally met up with Denny Mancini and Mickey Duff, and together they decided to take back some of the control. And they purchased some Wayans girls and went off to check the weight themselves somewhere. And But by now... It was now six hours since their arrival in Calais and uh, Duke hadn't eaten or drank a single thing. And as you would, he was getting irritable. They finally got to a gym and they were ready to check weight when Duke was told that he needs a medical, even though he had already had one in Harley Street, London, and actually had a certificate to prove it. Of course, the powers that be that had, uh, they actually deemed that the certificate was inadequate and they requested that another medical be done by their physician. And this is what Duke recalls. He said, I had to wait for their doctor to arrive and have a medical with their doctor. This took another couple of hours out of our day. Then after seeing their doctor, I had to wait another couple of hours before I could check my weight. Now I'm about a pound over the weight. I had to skip that off, did my check weight, and now I'm back on the weight. What an absolute... <laughs> unbelievable moment. I mean, they absolutely done a number on Duke McKenzie. Yeah, they certainly did. And after all the commotion, it was finally time to relax. But mentally, after all that, Duke wasn't his usual self. And he admitted, in my mind, all I'm saying to myself is, I'm going to smash this guy. Thierry Jacobs is going to get it. I've had to suffer all this. It was like an injustice because they took a bit of a liberty weigh-in was another new experience for Duke and he said it was the first time in my life I had been to a weigh-in with over 2,000 people where they were all baying for my blood. He tried to psych out Jacob 
when they squared off, but the Frenchman wouldn't look him in the eye. Duke felt that he had his card marked. Maybe you couldn't look him in the eye because he knew what was coming later that night. And this is Duke's recollection. He said, the night before the fight at the hotel, I've gone to bed about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and there's a knock on the door. I've gone to the door, but there's nobody there. I've gone back to bed. Two hours later, there's someone kicking at my door. I went to the door and there's no one there. Three o'clock in the morning. Someone's near enough kicking the door in. My coach leaped out of bed and was chasing someone down the hallway. We went down to reception, changed my room and went on a different floor completely just so I could get a good night's sleep. All these little things that they were doing. They were trying to get inside my head. Which they did because I hadn't been used to this sort of treatment before. On the night of the fight, well, Duke, Dudley, Colin, Denny and Mickey and Duke's mate Peter DeFratis were all in the dressing room. The door was getting kicked and whacked on. Another intimidation tactic. One of the worst stories I've heard about any type of antics a fighter and his team would use. I mean, I've not heard, heard many as, as bad as this, but this is quite shocking that they would go to any length to kind of win the fight, essentially. Absolutely. I've never heard anything like it. It was like one thing after another, isn't it? And, and, and I mean, the suddenly the, the intimidation uh, tactics, they went a step further when a group of French geezers literally came bursting into the change room and actually tried to threaten Duke. And that was when Peter, his sort of bodyguard friend, stepped in, grabbed one of them by the Gregory or the neck, chucked him outside. And from there, there was a scuffle ensued. Uh, and by Duke's account, one of the French fellas ended up on the deck. Um, this is just before the fight. So, I mean, you got all that. That's all happened. Now, the walk to the ring wasn't easy either. And Duke said that the crowd were making gestures with their hands, fingers. I'm sure some was racist, but it was all in French. So he obviously didn't understand. Someone actually spat at him. And some were trying to slap him on the way, on his way to the ring. I mean, it is, I mean, you, you can't, it's, it must be so hard to get your head in, in some sort of straight mental route. I mean, it, it's just so difficult. And well, the fight was actually aired live on Eurosport and you, you can actually see full coverage of a very grueling encounter on YouTube. But this is not your typical Duke McKenzie performance. And the mind games are clearly taking effect and it demonstrated in his performance because he, he had a more aggressive style. It wasn't one of Duke's main factors. He wasn't going to be always aggressive, but Duke went for broke from literally the first half of the fight, and he cut Jakob twice. They blamed the clash of heads as well they, for, for the cuts, but I think one of them might have been, I'm not quite sure about the other, but either way, if this fight was in Britain on these shores, it would have been stopped 100%. They were bad enough to be, we'll, we'll say how many stitches out after, it was bad. The fight was in the balance after about eight rounds and Jakob was bleeding profusely uh, and somehow his corner managed to stop the bleeding. Now, Duke actually remembers seeing a substance that wasn't clear looking. It was actually being used on Jakob and even Mickey Duff joked after the fight, whatever they used to stop it, as in both these cuts, could have kept the Titanic afloat. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant for me, Mickey. So with, all, with the carrot coming out of his eyes, no longer an issue, Jakob got stronger the more the fight wore on and eventually put Duke down for the first time in his career in the 11th round. So Duke took the first half and then Jakob came back in the second. Clearly the cuts being stopped helped him. Well, from there on we're going to let Duke reflect on the action in his words and he said at the end of the 11th after being decked I got up and went back to my corner and sat down and I'm ready to jack it in. My head's gone down and I'm thinking fuck it I'm not getting up. I had nothing left. Mickey Duff lifted my head and said, if you don't win this round, you'll be eating dinner by candlelight for the rest of your days. You need to go and fight. Duke remembered Denny Mancini giving him a good pep talk as well, saying, you can win this. They gave him the mental strength to get through the next round, even though he did go on to lose by a decision against a cut to shred Jakob, who needed 15 stitches after the bout. A defeat for Duke almost irrelevant really because the whole experience had moulded him into a better, more rounded fighter, technically and mentally. He of course credits the Jakob fight as one that absolutely made me. And he said I would class that fight as the hardest I've ever had by a mile. He learned lessons on how to prepare better going into fights and how to adjust better during fights. Mickey Duff sat him down, put his arm around him and he said, I'll bring me back. Duke reminisced. I think on that night I showed him 
I had character to fight hard, to dig in when I had to, not quit when I wanted to, and I showed him in that fight I could win another world championship. To his credit, he did bring me back. The respect between the fighters never faded either. Duke said that every time he sees me, as in Jakob, he says, Duke, you were the hardest boxer I ever boxed. And I always reply the same. Well, Duke had nothing but respect for Jakob, and he said that the way he beat me was classic and classy. He did things to me I could only dream about. Whenever I wanted to fight, he boxed and vice versa. He kept switching tactics on me. I learned more against Jakob than I had in my previous 26 fights. The tactics he used to beat me, I used in every other fight I had thereafter. And when Duke and his team left the hotel to catch the ferry returning home, they discovered it was only a 10-minute journey away. <laughs> uh, unreal. So that four-hour scenic route we ended up being a six-hour with all the, the, the weighing crap and the medicals. Ah, oh, unreal. You know, Jacob, Jacob though, uh, he did go on to be a future Hall of Famer in uh, Daniel Zaragoza um, 18 months later and become the WBC Super Bantamweight Champion. And with all he had learned, Duke entered 1991, albeit on the on back end of another defeat, in a more positive mindset. His injuries were behind him. He had a very active year compared to the one he had the year before. He won his next three fights in four months, all by stoppage. The first against the legendary journeyman in Peter Buckley, who had competed in only 23 fights by this point. If people don't know Peter Buckley, well, he would go on to finish his career a record of 32 wins, 256 defeats and 12 draws. This was the first of only 10 stoppages, uh, stoppage defeats on his record. So, I mean, it was impressive to knock him out. Mickey Duff told uh, Duke, we're going to get you another world title fight and it will be in the UK. And he stuck by his word. He got another one against Gabby Canizales, who was 48-7-1 for the Americans WBO bantamweight strap and it would be broadcast live on Sky Sports on the June 30th 1991 and Duke said that he as in Mickey Duff delivered as he said he would and I was so pumped for this fight his training and lead up to this second world title charge was on point he made weight comfortably and was as fit as a fiddle and there would be no excuses well this fight with Canizales it proved to be a career best performance from Duke and even he believes that that night in the Elephant and Castle was a career standout. And he said, boxers talk about how on their night they could beat anybody. Well, that was my night. Just for that one night only, I believed I could beat anybody. It just shows you how a bad defeat is not the end of the world and how you can actually learn more from a loss than any victory. And Duke said, I showed what I learned from the Jakob fight against Gabe Canazales. Same tactics Jakob beat me with, I used to beat Ganazales. I set a really quick pace, and because he couldn't nail me, I slipped, blocked, and if he hit me with one, I hit him with four. I just outboxed him for 12 rounds, and he never got near me. Duke McKenzie won every round on two judges' scorecards, and 11 on the third to become a two weight world champion. Now, after two successful defences of his newly acquired world title, most notably the Mexican puncher Cesar Soto, who later won the WBC featherweight strap, Duke surprisingly came unstuck against the unknown Puerto Rican puncher Rafael Del Valle, who was 12-0 on May 13, 1992 at the Albert Hall in London. In the worst performance of his career, Duke was actually dethroned in just 116 seconds. He put the defeat down to a bad code that he'd picked up about 10 days before the bout, and he asked Mickey to pull him out of the fight. Mickey, though, Lee misjudged the challenger and he reassured Duke that it would be a walk in the park. He was very rarely wrong, Mickey Duff, but this time he was horribly wrong. He made a horrible mistake and Duke said, Del Valle came over and helped himself and I got annihilated in the first round. That was it. The championship was gone. The rematch was never an option. Mickey Duff taught Duke, the last thing you want to do is go looking for them because it might not just have been their night. They might just have your number. That's great advice. Uh, a lot of the times when people do take these rematches, they do come a cropper. So, yeah, unfortunate for Duke. A great night. Fantastic performance to then go and lose it the way he did. Well, 
It wasn't good for him. He was embarrassed by the defeat and he admitted for three weeks after the fight, I couldn't leave my house. I was embarrassed to the point I didn't want to see or speak to anyone. There was no stone unturned going into that fight. There is no excuse. Five months later, another stoppage of Peter Buckley. Duke was thrown a lifeline to get his career back on track. And he took the risky decision to move up to the super bantamweight division and take on Jesse Benavidez, who was 34 1 and 1, the reigning WBO world champion, October 15, 1992, at the Lewisham Theatre in South East London. Now, Benavidez had only lost once in 36 outings. He was known as a big puncher, and he was also under the tutelage of Emmanuel Stewart. He was also well respected in boxing circles as well and was expected to put that final nail in the coffin of Duke McKenzie's career. Career. Most had written him off as just another body on Benavidez's CV. He went in as a very heavy underdog, but with his pride at stake and the chance to make British boxing history of becoming an unprecedented free weight world champion, Duke was not ready to depart from boxing without a fight. And he said, I looked at that fight as my last fight. I kept saying to myself, I've got to leave everything in that ring. The bigger and stronger Southpaw from, from Texas, USA, was clearly expecting an easy payday, and he was in for a real reality check. The two fought on an even key for much of the contest. Here's Duke's assessment of the fight after the first two rounds. He said about the third of the fourth round, one side taking his best shot, he realised he was in for the long haul and that he couldn't just come over and stop me gambled on knocking me out but I'm sure he hadn't gambled on the fight going 12 rounds because he was tired by the ninth. Duke continued with his description of this fight and he said at times the fight was a little bit messy but tactically I was on point. I was tying him up, pulling him around and jabbing his head off. I had it two rounds up going into the 10th round then in the 11th he quite clearly tripped over my foot but it was classed as a knockdown because I was throwing punches and he'd fallen over. The referee, Mariano Soto, made that a 10-8 round, and I stepped on the gas. When the bell sounded, it was obvious to anyone watching, Duke had done enough. All three judges gave it to Duke McKenzie. Harry Davis was 117-110, Nelson Vasquez 115-112, and Heinrich Muhart 115-113. And Duke McKenzie just entered himself into the record books alongside the likes of Bob Fitzsimmons as Britain's three-weight world champion. Now, since Duke set that record way back when, Ricky Burns actually recently has been another fighter who's gone on to do it, only the third fighter to be added to that prestigious list. But Duke himself is still really humble about it. He still pinches himself about it. And he says, even now, looking at that achievement, I realise I'm in such a privileged position. To win world championships in three weight divisions is quite an elite place to be. I'm incredibly proud and very grateful for everyone who helped and supported me along the way to achieve this. I have people who love me and look up to me and my family. And when my kids are all grown up and they have their own kids, someone will ask, is that your granddad? He did that. And back to his career and six months later on June the 9th, 1993, Duke lost his WBO title and his first defence. To another Puerto Rican, Daniel Jimenez at the Lewisham Theatre in South East London. After getting knocked down in the ninth, he lost a wafer thin majority decision. 115 114, 115 113, and 115 115. Duke himself refuses to moan about it. Instead, he actually gives Jimenez all the credit about that fight, and he says, I don't really have an excuse. I'd like to say preparation wasn't right, but I lost, and that's it. A better fighter won. And that's a bit of a trend, isn't it, with Duke? Because when he, when he won the world title on them separate occasions, he struggled to defend it. It was like his next fight came along and for whatever reason, he weren't able to defend it. But you cannot take anything away from the fact that he entered his name into the record books, becoming a three-weight world champion. And he was only the second man to do it at that point, Bob Fitzsimmons. And that was, what, 90 years before that? So for about 90 years, that record was held until Duke McKenzie came along and said, here you go, I'm going to put my name in that record book too. Unreal. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the, the first post-war three-way world champion. I mean, some people may even say Bob Fitzsimmons. I know he was born over here in, 
he was a Cornish lad, but he did live the majority of his life in Australia and America. So, you know, a proper born and bred British, Brit, you know, Brit, Englishman, Londoner. He's, he's the first to really do it, let's be honest. I mean, I, I, post-war, I always think post-war, if you're going to sort of, I'm not disrespecting what Bob done, but a magnificent achievement and one that just gets overrated. When we speak about that after, but but maybe Duke should have made the decision to retire after this point. I mean, after this defeat, when you sort of look at it, maybe in hindsight, he probably should have, but he would have been left with that nagging feeling, of course. Uh, could I have gone on and won my fourth world title in a fourth weight class? The answer to that question began six months later on ITV for the big fight live against Julie John Davison, who was 15 and four on December the 18th, 1993. Now, Duke travelled up to Manchester to fight for the British featherweight title now and the chance to win his fourth belt in his fourth weight division. Ironically, Duke stopped Davison in the fourth round and Duke was happy with the win. And Davison gave me a bit of stick, he said, before the fight. And I was never one for bad math and an opponent. So beating him gave me a nice sense of satisfaction. And with the British featherweight title added to his long list of gold, Duke picked up a couple of more victories on the same card as a new rising star in the featherweight division, one that I'm sure many of us will know, and that was Prince Nazim Hamid, who was a year shy of his first world title fight. The question was, did Duke have another big night in him and could he cut it at world level at the nine stone weight limit? Duke gave an interesting insight into logic in moving up through the weight classes as he did, and he said, as far as moving up goes, that had become the norm for me. In fact, I'd say moving through the weights gave longevity in my career. Dudley used to say to me, you'd make a better bantamweight you would have fly than flyweight. Then when I moved up, he said, I'd make a better super bantamweight than I would a bantamweight and so on. I always believed I could compete at featherweight domestically, even when I was at flyweight. So he was always buying it up. But being perfectly honest with myself, I never really believed in my heart of hearts that I would be world, a world-class featherweight. So I think what well, you just highlight on that friction where you say he wins a world title one division and, and then he loses it not long after and then moves up again. I think that was just the normal for him. He knew he was going to move up. So I think he just sort of says that there and Dudley always in his ear telling him that, you know, you can do this. Well, the world-class featherweight that Duke agreed to take on was none other than Steve Robinson, who was 18-9-1 and one on October the 1st, 1994, at the National Ice Rink in Cardiff, Wales. Some may wonder how a fighter with nine losses could be considered to be world-class. Steve Robinson, a.k.a. the Cinderella Man, won the WBO featherweight title the year before against John Davison when he had a record of 13-9-1. and one. After that victory, many pundits predicted his spell as a world champion to be brief. He actually proved them all wrong, explaining that winning the belt made me a better boxer. So he made four defences of that title before agreeing to take on Duke, who went into the fight as a favourite because of his previous successes in the lower weight categories. But with Robinson on a purple patch and Duke admitting himself that he was not at world-class level when competing at featherweight, his opportunity to become a four-weight world champion well, it was just one step too far. The fight itself was broadcast on ITV Sport. It was close going into the ninth round. But Robinson was rightfully ahead on all three of the judges' scorecards and it was evident during the fight that Robinson had the more power in his punches than Duke. So it was no surprise when the Welshman found the finishing blow that ended the fight in the ninth. It came via a powerful body shot that landed just under Duke's ribcage that sucked the life out of the former three-weight world champion. He couldn't recover in time to get back to his feet before referee Roy Francis counted him out. After the fight, when being interviewed with Robinson, Duke, again, as always, very humbled, gave no excuses, and he said, the better man won. At that point, Duke was 31, and he was participating in his 41st professional fight. He was the consummate professional, but with no disrespect to Steve Robinson, there is no doubt in our minds that it was the way that beat Duke that night more than Robinson. And again, I mean this in the greatest of respect to Robinson. Yeah. I think. If that was at the lower weight categories, if Robinson was lighter, I think Duke would have beaten him. If Duke was naturally able to have moved up to that division, I think Duke would have beaten him. However, that was just one step too far for Duke McKenzie. 
it was, and that's what always happens with a lot of these great fighters that, you know, you get to that next stage. It's always, you think these guys are amazing. And then when they step into the next division, it just, they struggle with it. And yeah, I mean, that's what happened. I mean, Robertson was on a great, he was world-class at that point. For that point in his career, for those two years or whatever it was, he was absolutely superb. And, and, and you know, and not many, I think he was ranked the number one as well. He's the number one in across all featherweight, you know, it, it, at featherweight across all the belts, you know, in all the organisations. So, you know, Robinson was flying and Duke just become, it was just too much, it was too big. It was just, it was too much for him to deal with. And, but, you know, Duke had actually fought under the Queensbury banner as well in his last three fights up until that point. And he had a brief spell under Frank Warren. Interestingly, if he had a beaten Steve Robinson, he would have gone on to face Prince Nazim Hamid in his first or second defence. And that would have been a very fascinating duel had it materialised. But, it would have been a massive up and task uh, to be in such a big puncher in the 126 pound division. I mean, it just wasn't Duke's prime weight, as we keep mentioning. Maybe if they dropped down, but obviously Naz weren't sort of there. So you know, it, it's it's one of those fights where it was a little bit of a fantasy fight. If it was at the prime weight, then who knows how that could have gone. But still determined to march on, Duke decided to travel to France on April 28, 1995, and he faced the EBU European featherweight champion. In Mendy Labundi, and he was 32 and 4. For the first time in Duke's professional career, he actually experienced back to back defeats after falling short in France for the second time via a unanimous decision. The result, though, was a bit of pill for him to swallow. And he said, When you ask me what my worst night in boxing was, for me, it was that fight against Labduni. Not because I lost, but because I know deep down that I won. And he was gutted about it. He actually returned to the Lewisham Theatre in June, clocked up his 20th and last knockout of Elvis Parsley. Not Elvis Presley, but Elvis Parsley. <laughs> and knocked him out in the first round. And he had the intention to fight on. But, well, Duke's life, it turned upside down one November evening. Now, after visiting his brother Dudley at his home in the morning, he left for the gym feeling like there was something different about his visit. Then later that evening, exhausted from his training session, Duke told his girlfriend, Julie, at the time about his feelings. He said, I saw Dudley this morning. Something worked quite right. I'll see him tomorrow. Unfortunately, very sad, for, sadly for Duke, but tomorrow just didn't come. And he recalled that I got a call later that evening. It was uh, his ex-wife, actually, that called him. And, and it finished him. That call confirmed the tragic loss of his brother Dudley to suicide at the age of 33. Duke knew his brother more than anyone, but he never suspected that he would do the unthinkable. I mean, who would? Duke told Boxing News there were no telltale signs. He had never tried it before. There were no tears. I didn't pick up on fuck all. Really, really difficult moment for him in his life. And you know, I did an article with him in 2020, and I remember having this conversation with him about that moment and, and and even now you know all these years later it's obviously really difficult for him to speak about and i can totally understand why you know because there was just no yep. there was no reasoning behind it like a lot of the times there isn't when this happens there's no reasoning behind it there's no telltale signs to indicate like, why they would have done this i think it was just a really sad moment for him in his life and obviously affected how he would then plan the rest of his boxing career but it would affect him massively because he spent months staring into an oblivion, feeling confused and distraught. He felt like his only option would be to end his life, to be with his brother again. But boxing, fortunately, was his saviour. And he recalled in his own words, the wheels were starting to come off in my life by then. I lost my brother, I was going through a divorce, and I'd lost my home. I'd lost everything and was pretty much homeless. I wasn't skilled at anything work-wise, so boxing was the only thing that kept me sane at that point. He did fight on twice in 1997, both eight-round decisions in Lewisham and the York Hall, respectively, before his last professional fight took place March 28th, 1998, which ended in defeat to Santiago Rojas Alcantara at the Crystal Palace Sports Centre. The anguish of losing his brother still plagues him to this day, but Duke managed to find a reason to keep living, and he said, I'm not in a rush to end my life or do something stupid. I was... Bereaved. When you lose somebody to suicide, there are more questions than answers. My brother didn't die of cancer. He wasn't run over. He decided to take his own life. There's no part of me that wants to do that. 
that thinks I want to be with him. I can't even contemplate it. Let me say this. He did a fucking good job when he did what he did. He wasn't fucking about. Well, so tragic. It really is. You know, you can't even, you just can't even contemplate that. I mean, he, he does in, in the Life Stories podcast, he does mention sort of like that there is some sort of element of Dudley's wife wanting to go to another country and, and him not wanting to go. But, you know, there, it, it just, it, there's nothing there. There's, there's no note. There's nothing. It's just crazy. I mean, what you, you just don't know what possesses people to do that. And well, Duke, obviously, you know, still plagues him to this day as you said and, and he he did retire eventually after that Crystal Palace defeat he retired with a record of 39 wins 20 by a knockout and only seven defeats three of which may we had came in his last six fights you know as we sort of mentioned I mentioned earlier I think he probably should have retired after losing that world title but you know he did go on to win a British so maybe that would have been the time to call it a day but following the retirement Duke decided not to become a trainer or a manager he he actually followed his art and he began running his own uh, successful boxing gym. It's not a box; it's a fitness gym, isn't it, Sean? It's, it's, it's sort of like a fitness boxing gym. He then dedicated his time to helping the less fortunate and he's now a very active ambassador for the mental health charity Mind. And he said himself that if I can help just one person so they don't have to experience that, the suicide of a loved one in their lives, then it will be worth it. I'm not a psychiatrist or a doctor or a Samaritan. But I think I'm a good listener. People like talking to me. I'm like a hairdresser. And when people go to the hairdressers, they tell them their life story. And that is what happens to me. And then in 2011, Duke McKenzie was awarded with the MBE, the member of the Order of the British Empire, in the Queen's birthday honours list for his services to boxing in the London Bar. He recalled as one of his greatest. And he said, to get that news, that I was going to be awarded an MBE was one of the greatest moments of my life. It is up there with the best of them, the birth of my children and winning world titles. Well, royalty came knocking again on Duke's door when uh, Princes William and Harry and the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate, they took part in pad sessions. They're obviously part of that mind charity as well. And Duke McKenzie said that William enjoyed the pad work. He's a bit of a live wire, that one. And um, it's so important for people at that level to be supporting people with mental health because they are so inspirational. This is the royal family. We're not talking about the Mayor of Croydon. These are people who are known world over. To have them engage with mind and spread the word is magical. And, you know, it really is dear to his art. And, you know, you just have to go to your the, po the podcast you did with him, Sean, to explain that. Yeah, that is a good good point to plug that, really. If anybody's not had the opportunity to listen to that on the main feed, then please do go and listen to it. I sat down with him for about half an hour and, and we had a good chat about his involvement in it and all the things that, that they do, the, the different charities. So we had the Mind Charity with the Ringside Rest and Care, the Ringside Charitable Trust. So it's definitely worth having having a listen to you know, the ins and outs of, of what he does and, and how he helps and how his support for these these different charities do help other people and of course you mentioned about his gym you know he's had a few gyms over the years he's currently at uh, duke box and that's the one he's currently running at the moment and, and and he does mention in that particular episode that we recorded about you know how much he he, he likes to help the youth and, and and get them through the doors and and trying to help them sort of get on the straight and narrow because there's nowhere else for them to go so if you are interested in listening to that you know please do because you know it just shows how much of a great guy he is so going back to where he's at now, I've mentioned a couple of things. He does still remain within boxing. He does do commentary, uh, most recently for ITV with Prince Nazim Hamad as well. He'd done a bit of colour color punditry with him, which was quite <laughs> funny, which was quite good. But I think the, the important thing about this episode for us is that he still gets forgotten about nowadays to the younger boxing fan or maybe the casual follower of the sport. Because there's no doubt about it, he deserves way more respect than what he gets. And, and it's big reason for us doing these career profiles a lot of the fighters that we do you know could be 20 30 40 years 50 years some of them even even older I mean, jack johnson well over 100 years ago from langford again another one that we've brought to the forefront and, and we've given so much great feedback on these episodes and it gives people these education on these fighters and the opportunity to go back and and, and listen to these stories you know if you look at duke mckenzie's career where it was in the late 80s early 90s he was a freeweight world champion if he was boxing today and he was in the current era of the sport and the finance that comes with it 
he'd most certainly be a millionaire. But you know what? He's still a he's still a humble guy, and you know this is what he says about it. He says, "I'm not ungrateful. I achieved what I wanted to achieve from the sport. I could write a book about it, and even then, it wouldn't be believable because I'm five feet seven and black. I'm from Croydon. I never achieved nothing as an amateur. To go on to say I've been." two-time British champion, a European champion, and a three-weight world champion. It's crazy. Now, to pretty much finish this story part of the episode off before our, we have our final thoughts on Duke, these again are more words from Duke himself, and, and this is what he says to anyone who they feel that they are alone, and he says, whatever is going on in your life, good, bad, or indifferent, you have to find a little bit of courage and find somebody you can really confide in. I'd say 9 out of 10 people are going through something in their life which they don't have an answer for. I'm not saying these people are suicidal or desperate, I just mean people have so much pressure on them today, they don't really know which way to turn. If you don't talk to people about your problems, you won't find any answers. Men generally, we tend to suppress the emotion because we don't like talking about feelings. But when you do open up, it's a lot easier to find what you're looking for. I think you're getting the idea of, you know, what to can you know it's so close to his heart in terms of people sort of opening up and speaking and and he does really encourage it and you know he's he's open to being here for himself you know he's the jukebox is in Croydon isn't it it is in Croydon it's not far from me if there's any you know people that are close to the area you know he's literally an open door really and the chances of you meeting him is very very likely I mean I know from my football team there's a guy that actually uses the jukebox and he frequently sees juke on a regular basis you know if he really doors always open he's just one of those guys that if you ever you know, it's nice to see that these these go through stuff like this and you're you're more than willing to help someone else which is fantastic and I suppose I mean the next thing is to finish this off show I mean is literally to discuss Duke and what we feel of him as a fighter more what he's done in the ring and now, there's no doubt that Duke is one of our all-time greats. I don't think there's many around that, that can argue that. I mean, we, we did have last top 10 greatest British fights ever, and he didn't hit the top 10. And I sort of had a look back again on that, just to sort of think, why didn't we have him in the top 10? And, and do you know what? I mean, looking at it, if you're looking at it as a collective and all the fighters that pre-war, post-war, throughout the war, then uh, he doesn't really. For me, I think he sort of sits in the top 20. But if you're talking post-war, Top 15 or day not. I mean, when you look at the names just ahead of him, there's some big names like that, like Lloyd Hunnigan, I think just edges him. You know, Nigel Ben Hamid, Eubank McGuigan, and there's a few more, Lewis and Frotch, people like that. Just my general opinion. I mean, he's a freeweight world champion. It's just, it's difficult because of the era he fought in and because, not not that the, the, his opponents were weak, no, 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 no disrespect to that, but I just, it was just the lower weight classes just didn't get the, the, the attention it would get today. And that is, that's not good on Duke. It's unfortunate for Duke because he would definitely be in a financially a better position. But there's no doubt in what he did is unreal. So, you know, top 15 post-war British, great British fighters ever for me all day long. Duke needs to be spoken about more. I mean, he's, he's very articulate as well. That's great to hear. You know, he's not having any problems in terms of from, from the injuries he suffered from the ring. He was a fantastic boxer. He was never one to go toe to toe, but he, he, he would if he could. And it was, it's been great watching back on the Yakub fights and, and things like that, just to see how he reacted to being in the trenches. And he was a masterful boxer at times in the ring, and he's definitely one that just gets overlooked. In terms of where I look at him as a great British fighter, I suppose it depends on how, you, how you're ranking people. I mean, you do see a lot of subjective lists, and it, we've, we've had these conversations many times before where we talk about it really depends upon the parameters in which you're putting these fighters into. If you're going yep. solely off achievements, then, he, then he's definitely in the top 10 because he was a freeweight world champion. You had the domestic titles, the British titles, the European title to, to accompany that. So in terms of, of solely off achievements, I would put him in the top 10 all day, no problem. But obviously, if you're going off a completely different list, if you're going around skill, achievements, and you're putting different parameters in there, then obviously it opens up the door a little bit more to, to different fighters, and, and, and quite easily you could mix a few of them around. But you know, I, I'm always going to say he's a top 10 British of all time for, for, for me when it comes down to achievements alone, because for him to have done what he's done, and even after he did it, it took a long time before anyone else did it. It didn't take as yeah. long. It wasn't as long as the gap between Bob Fitzsimmons and Duke, but even the gap between Duke and then Ricky Burns to come and do it. 
it's still a long time really when you consider it happening and it just goes to show you you know that it's not an easy feat to do it really isn't so for that alone he's got to be regarded as one of the greats to come from these shores generally as a, an individual like i said i've spent time with him he's he's great to be around he's always welcoming to people he's always welcoming to talk about his story and and, and his life and obviously we've had a, a bit of input from him directly into this episode which has been great but do you know i think the way to end this episode is to i'll leave you with another quote from this profiled boxer in duke mckenzie i think this is what we believe duke would want us to leave you with and this is what he said he said my brother still lives in me monday to sunday i have four other brothers who i love dearly clinton for example has been more like a dad to me than an older brother me and dudley had such a unique relationship and i've never had another relationship like that with another man in my life i feel quite robbed with him not being around there's a hole in my life which i'll never be able to fill i've stopped trying to fill it and now found coping mechanisms to deal with it and it's just harking back to the whole mental health awareness issues that we've spoke about previously in, in this episode that i've done with duke so again i'm plugging that because you guys should go and listen to it because there's a lot of other great anecdotes in there from from, from duke as well but it's been a pleasure to sit down and, and do this episode on duke and and really bring him back to the forefront and Yes, we've not gone through fight after fight after fight. We have mentioned a lot of his notable fights, but I suppose for me this was all about his story. It was all about looking at his his youth and his upbringing and how he got into boxing and how his amateur career was really hit and miss. But yet he somehow, some way, managed to get into that professional ring and become a free weight world champion, and and has left his his mark and left his legacy on the sport. And as he said himself, years down the line grandkids and great grandkids and their kids after that will will remember him in that way because of what he's achieved in the sport they will and i think i think the one clear thing for us is when we're doing the research for this particular profile was that there weren't many articles out there on his fights you know that just again shows you the time that not even there isn't much of a press out there on on some of these fights and this was sort of went really digging through the historic archives and sure in libraries and stuff there's nothing accessible to you online. So, you know, it just shows you again that just how underrated he really was. I mean, he had, when he won his first world title, he got that, that shot of fame and then he sort of went again. And I think just, I don't know what it was. I mean, I, I think Mickey Duff sort of said that, you know, he, he, the amount of money he was getting some of the fights was just ridiculous. Like it's just it, considering the, the, the statue of the fights in terms of the world titles and, and European titles, it just, they, he was getting Mickey Duff said that in some of his other bigger fighters, you know, they'd earn more in a training session like that. It was that was, it was that was just how it was. So it, you know, credit to Mickey to stick by him. And one thing that Duke always says is just how much of a great man Mickey Duff was, how much of a brilliant matchmaker he was, and it, he puts it down to him really. He puts it down to his brother, he puts it down to Clinton, he put it down to Colin Smith, but he never actually, very rarely puts pats himself on the back. So I think for us to do this. Is us patting him on the back and saying to him, like, just you've done amazing things in the ring and you are a British great. And it's nice to be able to do a career profile on him. And hopefully, those that are not too familiar with Duke McKenzie may actually start to realize that this guy was a sublime fighter in the ring and a nice guy outside of it makes it easier to root for him. If you didn't watch any of his fights, go back and watch them because there's some great performances for him and a, a truly great. British boxer and yeah it's good to do it Sean it's, it's great to bring these to light and a pleasure to do this one uh, a big thanks to Duke of course for his input into this episode and thank you to everybody for listening to this episode as well we hope you've enjoyed it and if you have do let us know you can go onto the social media channels uh, career underscore profiles on Twitter and then the BTR Boxing Podcast Network pages on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The YouTube channel is available there as well. So please do go and subscribe or follow us on there. And when you see the episode, go live on social media. Make sure you give it a share. Make sure you give it a retweet on, on Twitter. Make sure you share it in your stories on Instagram. It's much appreciated when you guys go and do that. And a big thank you finally to the patrons of the podcast you'll have got access to this early for being a patron and if you're not a patron yet and you haven't had the opportunity to look at what it is we do there please do go and check it out at patreon.com forward slash btr boxing podcast 
A big shout out to Martin Mulligan, who's recently just become a patron. Thank you to you, Martin. Long time listener has now made that dive into becoming a patron and has got access to all the unreleased content to the general public. So hopefully Martin's in enjoying all that and you can enjoy that too as well if you go and sign up to be a patron of the BTR Boxing Podcast Network. And that's it for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed listening to the career profile of Duke McKenzie, MBE. 